distinguished mayor of Waynesville and, and also the chair of the Southwestern Commission, Kevin Brown. Uh, no kin, but we have lots of cousins everywhere. I hate podiums. Old men and podiums don't go together. As pointed out, I am Gavin Brown. I'm the mayor of Waynesville. More importantly tonight, I'm the chair of the Southwest Commission. The Southwest Commission, as most of you know, was started about some 42 years ago. We've been around for a long time. We have a great executive director now. Mr. Shirby, stand up. Brian, of course, was mentored by Bill Gibson. I think I saw Bill earlier. Where's Mr. Gibson? There he is. Where did he go? If he comes in, we'll introduce him again. The, tonight's event is, is not a timed event, but we're going to keep things moving. Ms. Brown told me that I was not allowed to, use, to do my usual routine with the microphone. So if I start shaking, it's because I'm having withdrawal symptoms. The Southwest Commission, as I've indicated, is a community of seven counties and the EBCI. We've been around a long time. We are working together. The opt-in process started about a year and a half ago. Some people thought that quarter K was a problem. I personally saw it as an opportunity. Tonight we have a chance to create a legacy, and I really think that that's going to happen. Thank you. The event tonight is trying to bring together the possibility of planning for the future. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. If I get a round of applause, Bill Gibson. Who in this room didn't receive some help from Bill Gibson? Anybody not know who Bill Gibson is? Ryan? Mr. Gibson did a good job there, too. But that's what it's about. Bill worked with us, and we're going to work with you tonight. This is an opportunity for us to look down the road to create a legacy in the area of economic development, transportation, and most importantly, the people of this region. At the end of the night, I hope that all of you are committed to creating this future. Yes, Austin has consultants, but for the most part, the speakers that you're going to hear tonight, the people standing at this podium, in fact, all of those folks are local folks. They are your friends and neighbors. They are people that you know on a first name basis. So I believe that you will be convinced that where we're going with this process is in fact correct. And at the end of the night, I think that you will find, just as I have, that we have an opportunity here create a future and a legacy that we'll all be proud of. First of all, I'd like to introduce, it probably doesn't need the introduction of Michelle Hicks, the Chief. Michelle, can you come up, please? <laughs> the the Smithsonian is now running a series of uh, interviews and lectures, so if any of you would like to know a little bit more about the Chief and or the tribe and their history. Uh, you might go to the Smithsonian website. It's a great interview and provides an introduction. Chief Michelle Hicks. Mayor, I appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to hear about the Alpha City Center. Good to see you here. I know we, uh, we have a lot of politicians. Anybody watching the crowd a couple days ago? Yeah. I know it's a tough process. And, uh, you know, public service, uh, we don't always get the chance to use think we deserve. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it does take hard work. It takes a lot of commitment and dedication. I want to thank you know, my wife, Marsha, for being here. for a big hand. <laughs> and I also uh, want to thank uh, Mr. Jerry Wolf. He's a, he's a wonderful man. He is a man that, uh, of, of, uh, besides my dad, that, that I look up to the most. In, in, uh, in charity. So, uh, Jerry, please stand. Let's give you another name. He's also a decorated veteran. We love him today. I want to thank the Vice Chief. Uh, this man has been my partner for 11 years. He didn't choose me or I didn't choose him. But we made a pretty good team after that. So, uh, one thing we committed to is uh, one thing we committed to early. Uh, in this administration was that we had to make sure that Eastern Band was successful for many reasons. For the children, for the families, for the elders, 
But to do that, we also knew that we had to make sure that the region was part of that success. And we committed to that. We committed early, and we're still committed. So uh, I thank everybody for coming out today. We also have uh, other council folks here. Tommy, could you please stand? Tommy Sanucci is the elder of our tribal council. This lady makes me so mad sometimes, like she may. But she's a great leader, and we appreciate her leadership and, and uh, you know what she's done for her tribe. Are there any more council members in the room that I didn't uh, recognize? Uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you, the, uh, the opt-in folks. I'm not sure who all of them are but I know that you guys have done a lot of work. And again, you know, I would love to think one day that when you think of... Uh, you know, the triangle or the twin cities or those type of things. People look at Western Carolina and say, wow, look what they were able to accomplish. Even those guys that do language such as y'all or over yonder, you know, they're not as dumb as we thought they were. Those guys knew about technology, they knew about good health care and good housing. They knew how to create jobs that were diversified, that, that use the technology of today and the future, and they grew this area beyond anybody's dreams. And my hope as we come out of this meeting is that we, we set that stage for these young folks that are coming on. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of obstacles right now, a lot of obstacles for, for our young folks. But if we do it right, guys, we can set that legacy as was mentioned in the video. And it's not just one thing. It's many things, and uh, so again, I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words, and welcome to Cherokee. God bless each one of you. Thank you. Do I see something in the future of that young man? That's a pretty good speaking job, uh, We have other folks here tonight that would like to share a little bit of their ideas and their thoughts about this process. Uh, We've got a gentleman here from the ARC. I just had the opportunity to meet him. Scott, you want to come up and say hello to us a little bit? Scott's with ARC. He's actually an advisor to the ARC. Uh, I think, as I told him earlier, the ARC is one of those entities that holds a, a dear place in my heart because it really works with the region. Scott? Thanks very much. My name is uh, Scott Hurston. I am the transportation and international trade advisor to the Appalachian Regional Commission up in Washington, D.C. We are an economic development partnership between the federal government, 13 member states, and 73 local development districts. Um, in talking with so many of you here tonight, I kept thinking that what, what we're doing here, I think, is more important than many people think of. I mean, what we're doing here is we're thinking about and we're talking about and we're kind of strategizing about is where we fit in the Thinking about and we're talking about and we're strategizing about how do we develop our resources and our capabilities not simply survive this economic transition, but actually thrive in it. Thinking about and talking about and strategizing about how we run faster than we've ever run before. It was about 10 years ago, I first read a book written by a guy named Tom Friedman. Uh, the name of the book was The World is Flat. And it talked about life in the 21st century. Very interesting book, filled with exciting stuff and scary stuff. Good stuff and bad stuff. And when I was reading the book, I came to a caption. I read the caption. And I kind of went, ooh. I read it again, and I went, ooh. So I went to the kitchen, I pulled out a pen, and I undermined that pen, and I will share that pen with you tonight. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the lion or it will be killed. And every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up. It knows that it must outrun the gazelle, or it will stop. It doesn't matter if you're a gazelle or a lion, because when the sun comes up, you better start running. The ferocious nature of the global economy of the 21st century. What you're doing here tonight, talking about the Optium program, is bringing this community together and thinking about your future. Thinking about where you fit in the 21st century. And I will tell you, from all of us at the Appalachian Regional Commission, to all of you in Western North Carolina, congratulations on the job well done. I look forward to taking this elsewhere in my region and showing it as a model and telling other people you should do what they're doing in Western North Carolina. So again, I thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. I've been down to Washington just to have dinner with you. And I wish you the best of luck. I look forward to working with all of you. Kind of move these strategies and goals and objectives forward. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.
I promise you, Vincent, just to get a one-way ticket to stay here. That's a good idea. What's wrong with that? John Sullivan's here tonight with the uh, Federal Highways Administration. John, there he is. One of the other partners in this uh, whole process. Thank you for coming up from Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the positioning process with the local community and the region. You know, I, we see at Federal Highways the greatest challenge facing us with transportation is how do we improve mobility and accessibility and spur economic development across this country. I think what you're doing here is developing a vision and a plan for how it will impact you, how mobility fits within your vision, within your goals, within your objectives. Instead of if you travel the interstate system like I did, you travel and you see great development in certain sections of it, and then you see lots of rural areas on our interstate system that don't have development. You wonder what happened. And it's because we built the system without taking into consideration the vision, the values, and the goals of the community. So I'm very excited to see the results of the opt-in process and what your goals, your objectives, and your vision is so that the Federal Highway Administration can better determine how we can fit transportation and mobility within the region. Thank you. John pointed out that this is driven by the local community. This is our opportunity to take care of problems here locally. And as I said earlier, these are opportunities. Uh, in fact, speaking of highway, John, Mike Holt is here with the uh, NCDOT. Mike, there he is. You know, when, uh, when I was asked to participate in the opt-in effort on behalf of the uh, Eastern Band, I immediately saw opportunities. You know, we had just completed construction on this facility. And the hot topic at that time was uh, the addition of a second casino in, coming into Cherokee County and the associated jobs you know, and of course, as well as the infrastructure uh, needs, you know, water, sewer, roads, access, um, those type of things. And I felt that through interactions with uh, the surrounding counties and, and communities, as a member of the opt-in team, I would be in a position to help tell the tribe's story. 
I tell the stories that uh, presently relates to our interest and involvement in Western North Carolina. Our land ownership is uh, in six of the seven counties that the opt-in planning effort covers. The tribe's story is not unlike our neighbors in the surrounding areas of Western North Carolina. We know that everything, the region's economy, its infrastructure, its culture, begin and end with the mountains and the river valleys. And they're the source of, of our advantages, and they're a source of our challenges. And the challenges that have to be overcome, particularly the challenges that we see as it uh, relates to connectivity. And both in terms of physical connectivity through roads, broadband and other infrastructure, as well as in terms of connecting community to community over these mountains and these hollers. For thousands of years, before Europeans faced these opportunities and these challenges in these mountains, the Cherokee lived and learned from the landscape and from the living things that shared this space. And for hundreds of years, the descendants of the Cherokee and their neighbors have been experimenting in sorts with ways in which their cultures combined and informed one another. There have been times of intense conflict and times of intense collaboration. We should all be wiser from that experience and be ready to move into a new era stronger together because of it. You know, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, we now have investments and in land ownership in six of the seven Region A counties. Proud to say the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians employs more people and generates more income than, uh, for the region than any other private sector entity. And we're looking for ways, and we have become uh, partners in planning for regional transportation needs, for broadband, for healthcare, for tourism, and for relating to the United States government lands that join the communities throughout our region. And as the co-hosting of this gathering tonight suggests, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians welcomes the opportunity to take a role in a coalition of regional institutions, both public and private, to strengthen opportunities for all our communities for generations to come. You know, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says the two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the fellow. And in Proverbs 11, 14, the Bible says, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. I ask you tonight to cross boundaries, cross political divisions, if you will, that are created by people. Look in your heart. When you, when you sit alone, you're able to pray. Pray for the leadership of this Western North Carolina area. Pray that they will be able to let go of some of the hindrances probably or possibly that might keep them from reaching across that political division for the good of all. We've got to pray for guidance and we've got to pray for understanding. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to say a few words and I, I certainly want to thank the opt-in group for their confidence in choosing me. I again want to thank the Chief and our tribal government for uh, allowing
allows me to participate in, in, in the last year and a half effort. So enjoy your evening and, and thank you very much. As both of you know, Larry runs the day-to-day -day affairs of the tribe, and it's pretty obvious that he's been very successful if you look around you and see what's been done. Uh, he's left the speech up here for me. I'll frame it, Larry, to send it to you, okay? Go work on your golf game a little bit. How those grandchildren do it, okay? All good, that's what I like to hear. Nine, nine. When did you have time to work? <laughs> Our keynote speaker tonight is one of the more dynamic people that I've met in the last year or so. As an attorney and a trial attorney, I would not want to see him on the other side of the uh, aisle when jury arguments were made because he invariably would convince everybody that he was right. <laughs> no question about it. The gentleman brings to this area and to his job and to his position that enthusiasm that you always want to see him to lead. In fact, he's so fast and so good that he went right from the salad right to the dessert. Because he was chomping at the bits from up here. Big warm welcome for Chancellor Belgium. So very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening with a very distinguished group to talk about our future. I'm here tonight not just because I've been asked to speak, but because I love this place, my home in western North Carolina. Susan and I regularly turn to one another and say something to each other along the lines of, can you believe we get to live here? This is a region of extraordinary beauty, of superb outdoor recreation opportunities of excellent eating, of treasured culture, of stunning art and craft, of valued heritage, and of the most wonderful people we have ever met. Can you believe we get to live here? However, all this wonderfulness aside, I believe that we in Western North Carolina are at a critical juncture at which we must decide how we will go forward, succeed, and thrive in a time in which the breathtaking pace of change finds us leading within an increasingly unfamiliar landscape. And it is my belief that the future of this incredible place where we get to live depends on our ability to chart a thoughtful course forward together within this context. So what is this context? In my view, we are living at a paradigm-shifting moment in which disruptive change is transforming the way we live, work, and play. Let me just rattle off a few examples of this disruptive change. Technology is changing just about every facet of our lives. Forty years ago, we played vinyl records. Since then, we've been through 8-track tapes, cassettes, and CDs. Until now, we don't even buy anything anymore we, that we can hold in our hand. We just sort of purchase a tune on iTunes that resides on our computer in some place called the cloud, whatever that is. <laughs> Remember letters and postcards? Now, we are emailing and Twittering and Facebooking and Instagramming. Remember when grandparents talked to their grandchildren on a box that was plugged into the wall? Now, we Skype. Manufacturing used to mean that work was done by hand. Now a huge portion of manufacturing has moved to automated processes, which means the skills needed in the manufacturing workforce today are completely different from those that were needed 40 years ago. Indeed, while there are many advantages associated with a lot of these technological advances, they have also completely disrupted and changed entire industries. Technology certainly represents disruptive change. In this millennial generation era, we're seeing creators, inventors, entrepreneurs, and outside-the-box thinkers congregate in cities and regions which are often anchored by universities which graduate creative types, areas that have proven, perhaps because of their proximity to universities, to be fertile territory for innovation is demonstrated by small business generations. So simply put, creators, inventors, and entrepreneurs are clustering in localities to nurture innovation. 
But if the inventors and entrepreneurs are migrating toward Austin, Boston, San Diego, Seattle, DC, and Atlanta, what are the ramifications for all other localities as a result of this dynamic and disruptive trend? The healthcare industry is undergoing massive change, framed by the rapid rise of healthcare costs, the numbers of people who can't afford healthcare, increasing shortage of healthcare workers, the migration of medical records to e formats, the consolidations, mergers, buyouts of healthcare systems, agencies, and organizations, growing trends in cross disciplinary care in alternative medicine, and of course, the Affordable Care Act. The proliferation of hybrid vehicles responds to environment friendly and cost saving desires of consumers. But fewer gallons of gasoline purchase results in less taxes raised for the maintenance of highways. How will we take care of our highway infrastructure in an era of hybrid vehicles? North Carolina's population is becoming older and more diverse, the latter particularly tied to the rapidly growing Latino population. What implications will these demographic changes have on policy development and the education, healthcare, and social service sectors in our society? Representation in our North Carolina General Assembly is shifting from rural majority to urban majority. How will we engage in this changing political landscape to advance causes important to the rural parts of our state? And we can't broach the subject of disruptive change without acknowledging the remarkable impact of the Great Recession itself, the fallout of which continues to complicate an already complicated landscape. Clearly, large numbers of individuals are experiencing economic stress in their personal lives, which in turn contributes to economic stress at local, state, and national levels. There are not enough good jobs, and in some places jobs exist, but workers with the appropriate skill sets and training are lacking. The economic crisis, though, is having a ripple effect, causing significant change throughout our society. Let me offer just one example of this from my own field of higher education. The economic crisis of recent years has resulted in declines in state revenues, which have in turn resulted in reductions in state appropriations to higher education institutions. We at Western have lost $35 million in annual funding each year. We've responded by eliminating academic programs for few majors and eliminating an administrative division, and though we're real, therefore we're realizing efficiencies and we're reallocating resources to degrees in high demand. But as we surf the surfing the horizon, we don't see the return of all that money we've lost anytime soon. And so as we contemplate how we're going to continue to grow to provide educational opportunities for greater and greater numbers of students who need university degrees to get good jobs, and how we will extend our reach to assist in economic and community development in the western region of our state, we are looking for alternatives. That is, we are forced to change the way we do business. And so, we're partnering with four community colleges, including Southwestern, to offer a collaborative approach to nursing education, wherein nursing students can get an associate's and a bachelor's degree by going to school at both our institutions simultaneously for a grand four-year total of $17,000. We're pursuing additional facilities on our campus through public-private partnerships, in which private developers will do the building on state property. West Carolina and UNC Asheville, we have two very small internal audit operations. And as we grow, we don't have the staff to keep up with the workload. So we've entered into a, a partnership where we have a check to balance system which helps both institutions without a great deal of additional expenditure. And currently, Western is, is partnering with four community colleges and one other university, representing three contiguous states on a major federal grant which could have a extraordinary educational and economic development implications for our region. With us to change the way we do business and to seek out alternative funding streams as means of fulfilling our missions. And that can be a very good thing. But this is the phase of disruptive change brought on by the Great Recession. And one sector of our, after, of our society after another is facing this same subject. The term disruptive change characterizes our time. There's one other disruptive change which I want to explore with you and with which we in Western North Carolina must come to grips if we truly want to position our part of the state for a future defined by prosperity. We live in a time in which regions have become 
the fundamental geography which define economic competitiveness. And the degree of our future economic success will be determined by the degree to which we unite as a region in this new world order. This was, of course, not always the case. There was a time when towns, counties, and cities were largely self-reliant, taking care of their own needs and competing with other towns, counties, and cities for businesses, industries, population growth, tourism, and so forth. Our municipal, tribal, and political boundaries became the boundaries of our primary interests. And it's easy to see why. New people and businesses moving into a city or county bring with them greater tax revenue, which supports the city or county in which people locate. And so recruiting people and businesses into a specific locale made a lot of economic sense on the local level. We elect officials to city, county, and tribal offices and their responsibilities are legitimately focused on the jurisdiction which elects them. So our municipal and political boundaries have grown over time to define the territory of interest, and those boundaries have become quite naturally dividing lines between us and them, you and me. It really is quite logical. And in Western North Carolina, this boundary-defining culture has been reinforced by history associated with our geography, wherein rugged terrain separated us from one another, and mountains such as Balsam and Cowie have exacerbated the separation between cities, counties, and the Eastern Band. But this is a different era. Cell phones and computers and 24-7, 365 entertainment and news programming and four-lane highways and multinational corporations have rendered boundaries much less significant than they once were, and have ushered in an era of hyperconnectivity across wide ranges of geography. Geography and boundaries just do not contain us as they once did. And as this border boundary breakdown has occurred, enterprising regions have worked hard to take advantage of the situation for their benefit. Let me offer several examples in which I think you'll be able to see the new models in action. The Research Triangle is one of the best known regional success stories around. Decades ago, really long before this, this regional trend of recent years got started, three cities, Chapel Hill, Durham, Raleigh, in three different counties, Orange, Durham, Wade, with three universities, Chapel Hill, Duke, and NC State, launched the Research Triangle Park an innovative, collaborative strategy which has turned into one of the most phenomenal research regions in our country. The leaders of this effort, some people thought they were crazy at the time, recognizing the power inherent in the talent and research associated with their three universities located in close proximity to one another, and they sought to capitalize on it, and capitalize on it they did. RTP has been a magnet for company after company after company, and that region has soared. Another example, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Greenville and Spartanburg have an historic rivalry, but they have forged a collaborative way forward which probably got its most significant jumpstart from the location of the BMW plant in Greer some years ago. The region has grown beyond that plant into an automotive powerhouse region, and that did not happen with two neighboring cities and counties working at odds in isolation. Now the state of South Carolina is capitalizing on the synergies around this growth, locating an inland port right between the two cities in Greer. And there are leaders in the greater Asheville area who, for the sake of economic development in their metro area, are looking to see how they can connect down I-26 into the dynamism which characterizes the thriving greenville Spartanburg region. In essence, seeking to become an extension of the greenville Spartanburg phenomenon. I have an example from my own experience when I was a provost at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. In 2007-2008, Hewlett Packard was seeking a location for its newest plant and Central Arkansas and two other locations in the country were finalists. Central Arkansas landed the, the plant by working across county lines. The plant located not in Pulaski County, where Little Rock and North Little Rock are, but in next door Faulkner County because of the available land, space, and package that county was able to put together. 
But one of the key reasons that HP chose Central Arkansas was its access to the engineering graduates coming out of our university located 25 miles away in Little Rock. Our engineering dean collaborated as a member of the team working to recruit that company to our area. We were working as a region to draw in the HP plan. And the fact of the matter is that despite the fact that the plan itself is in Faulkner County, HP employees are shopping, dining, and finding their entertainment in Pulaski County, and some of them live there. A business moving to the region helps everybody. And I should note that regions also pull together for more reasons than just economic competitiveness. As a quick example, let me mention the 18 counties in Northeast Ohio, which have collectively pursued and received millions of grant and loan dollars to fund collaboration projects in the last few years, which will assist them in fiscally different difficult times. A subset of communities in that region is putting a $100,000 state grant toward a possible merger of four fire departments into one fire district, a move that the grant application states could save the four cities more than $18 million over three years. The state of Ohio awarded a loan to three local governments in the region to create a common EMS dispatch center, initially saving each community hundreds of thousands of dollars. Instead of each local government having to spend four to five hundred thousand dollars, the three together spend six hundred thousand on a single system. And while there is clearly a financial benefit to pursue shared services in this case, the improved technology that came with the system also allows residents to text and Facebook for EMS squads. And thus the local residents are getting better service. Regions today have become the geographic locus of self-reliance. And regions compete with regions to attract business, industry, investment, tourism, talent, and the creative class. And if we in Western North Carolina are going to be successful in this environment, we must partner with one another and form a regional compact. So if we're going to pursue our future together, and I would argue that we have to, where are we going from here? What is our plan? In my experience, there are two basic ways people tend to plan. One which takes its point of departure from the starting point, and one which takes its point of departure from the ending point. In the case of the former, the planner says, here's where I am, I'll do this, I'll try this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And in five years, it will have made it this far. In the case of the latter, though, the planner, with a lot of thought, analysis, input, and ample doses of both realism and ambition says, that's where I want to end up. That's my goal, and now here are the steps I must take to get to this. Both approaches will result in progress, but the latter will get you a lot farther down the road faster than will the former. So my word of advice in planning is to start with your end goal in plain sight. And from my perspective, we, you and I, have done just that through the opt-in process a project which has engaged our region's citizens and elected officials repeatedly in various forums to identify priorities and to chart our regional path forward. The emerging details of the opt-in process outline broad brushstroke action steps focused on the vision which we have helped to define by participating in this process. Action steps such as creating a regional identity that will help the region market itself on a national and global scale, Expanding transportation connectivity to areas outside of our seven county region. Creating an investment capital fund for emerging entrepreneurs. Addressing wellness and healthy lifestyles across all age groups. Training the workforce of the future. It is a bold plan. It is an inspiring plan. It is a plan that promises a future defined by healthy economies and communities. And it is our plan. If you are like I am, as you read through the bold picture which the opt-in process is painting, you also have this need to see yourself in it. What you might tackle. What this looks like on the ground. So let's imagine some possibilities. Imagine neighboring counties that follow the example of those communities in northeastern Ohio and pursue shared EMS or fire department services, which will save local communities funding and yet provide great and needed service. Imagine the Region A counties and the Eastern Band pooling at least some monies and efforts to draw tourists to our region rather than to a specific community 
organizing perhaps a, a mountain Main, Main, Main Street trail or a heritage trail or an antique and crafts trail or a waterfall trail which takes people from Waynesville through Silva to Cherokee, Bryson City, Franklin, Hazel, Murphy, Andrews, and Robbinsville. Or constructing a joint website in which we detail outdoor activities in the region, great home cooking in the region, best bed and breakfast in Western North Carolina, and so forth. Imagine a regional tourism initiative which targets all attendees at conferences that go to Asheville, Greenville, Spartanburg, Atlanta, Chattanooga, and Knoxville to coax them to come spend a weekend in our mountains, either before or after their conference. Imagine pulling together an annual brainstorming, brainstorming summit for regional leaders to explore common themes, best practices, and collaborative opportunities around such topics as educational attainment, the reduction of the percentage of population that lives below the poverty line and environmental sustainability. Imagine that in realization of the fact that the difference in median weekly earnings between a high school graduate and a college graduate in 2014 is $457 per week, and that the national unemployment rate for high school graduates is 7.5%, while that of college graduates is 4%. Imagine that our schools, community colleges, and universities put their heads together to figure out strategies to ensure that our young people proceed successfully from kindergarten through elementary, middle, and high school to community college in Western Carolina, always ready to meet the expectations of the next educational level. Imagine the region's industry setting up a formal program of mentoring high school students in critical needs areas such as science, math, engineering, and technology. Imagine the region's industries and economic development director collectively studying the region's industry inventory to identify related industries as targets for recruitment to the region, all in an effort to pursue a cluster of industries, much as the Greenville-Spartanburg region has pursued the automotive cluster. Imagine the region's various health care systems and social service agencies building a collaborative, patient-centered, well-oiled network to ensure optimal health care for every single person in our region. Imagine our region working together on grant applications in pursuit of basic infrastructure needs like an extensive high-speed broadband network. Just imagine what might be and we, what we might do together as a region. So we know that coming together as a region is imperative. We have defined the vision and priorities for our region. My question to you is this. Who will take this vision forward? Who will have the courage to help shape a new approach to leadership which balances the needs of individual communities with those of our region as a whole? Who will help to define a new model which celebrates our historic self-sufficiency but on a regional scale? Well, let me step forward and say that Western Carolina University is ready to be a leader in this effort. When two years ago we undertook at the university an intensive year-long strategic planning process that Larry Carney was on, one of the signature results of the study was the institution's reaffirmation of its commitment to Western North Carolina. Western Carolina does not have all of the answers, and we never will. And Western Carolina cannot, should not, and must not take over any effort, idea, or responsibility which is the purview of our region or its constituent communities. We are only part of the equation. We pledge to be a leader, not the leader. But we will be partners with you in pursuit of regional economic and community development. And we have intellectual capacity and discipline-based expertise to bring to the table. We will work to fulfill our fundamental reason for existing, the production of graduates in engineering and nursing and social work and education and entrepreneurship and tourism and recreation and criminal justice and many other fields to meet the workforce needs of Western North Carolina. We will work with Western North Carolina through a number of outreach efforts, such as our Center for Rapid Product Realization, an incredible engineering outreach center which utilizes prototyping and reverse engineering approaches to assist, sustain, and grow businesses and industries in Western North Carolina. The College of Business and Center for Entrepreneurship, 
which is a portal for small businesses in our region to access the full range of expertise in business fields such as marketing and management. The Small Business and Technology Development Center at WCU, arguably the best of its kind in North Carolina, which is an incredible resource to small businesses in a range of business functions, from strategic planning to the integration of technology into business practices. Our hospitality and tourism program, which under the leadership of our new tourism guru and data hound, Steve Morse, who's here this evening, has launched an annual tourism conference to bring together tourism professionals from the region to explore data and information and to build a network of tourism-based businesses to build the region's tourism capacity. The clinics associated with the new College of Health and Human Sciences building, which represent a terrific venue for specialized care for the people of our region, and a great partnership opportunity for healthcare agencies from throughout the region. Forest Stewards, a nonprofit organization affiliated with Western Carolina and its Department of Geosciences and Natural Resource Management, through which faculty and students work with local landowners to conserve and sustain forests on their properties and with municipalities like Waynesville to protect vital watersheds. Two wonderful leadership capacity building opportunities made possible by the generosity of the Cherokee Preservation Foundation. The Culture Regional Leadership Program designed to support experienced leaders in our region and the Right Path Leadership Program designed specifically for aspiring young leaders in Cherokee who pursue leadership development with and through traditional Cherokee values. And Western Carolina's new annual regional conference, the first iteration of which will take place this November, and which will bring leaders from throughout the region together to explore issues critical to the future of Western North Carolina. Indeed, I anticipate that this regional conference will be a natural extension of our opt-in trajectory. West Carolina has a lot to offer in pursuit of our regional vision of economic and community development. But while we are ready and willing to roll up our sleeves and go to work, we cannot and should not and will not shoulder this responsibility alone. Western Carolina is ready to be a player, but not the player. A leader, but not the leader. So who will be a partner in making more of this region than we ever thought possible? Who is willing to help build a regional whole which is greater than the sum of its individual parts and which will be able not just to survive but to thrive in the era of regional economies? Who will take this vision forward so that we prosper together rather than struggle individually? Who will own this vision? There is a clear answer. We, all of us, must do this together. My father is a now retired Baptist minister. I remember one of his sermons, which probably would surprise him about as much as anyone. That I, actually remember. <laughs> I remember one of his sermons in which he recounted the story of a minister who asked his congregation one Sunday evening to stand and recite favorite Bible verses. So people stood up and cited passages that, that had particular meaning for them. Among them was an elderly gentleman who stood up and said, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Well, the catch is that's not really a Bible verse. Rather, it comes from a 1698 writing by Algernon Sidney. But you know, it's a statement that resonates with many. It's underlying sentiment that we shouldn't just wait around for someone else to come help us, take care of us, do for us, is very much part of the fabric of this place we love. We value being self-reliant. In the era of the region, though, we must redefine self-reliance to encompass a broader concept of who our self is. It's our region. I began this talk saying that I am here this evening because I love this place, my home in western North Carolina. Let me amend that statement, though, to say that I am here because I love this place, my home in western North Carolina. And because I am passionately committed to being part of a future for our region in which all will prosper. If we believe in Western North Carolina, and if we are committed to a future for Western North Carolina defined by healthy economies and communities, we must, every single one of us, pledge ourselves to this cause. The time for talk is ending. The time for action is at hand. Not one of us can do everything. 
We are all in this together, and I, for one, am thrilled to be along for the ride. Thank you very much. to look at this a little differently. He is saying to us, I have seen the solution, and it is us. And he is challenging you to do that tonight. As I was sitting there, though, I thought to the Chancellor, I said, Chancellor, you know what? The state got it right in 1972 when they named us Region A. <laughs> Are we not the best? <laughs> Don't we have the best people here? Yeah, amen. Oh, an amen, please. Can I have an amen? amen. <laughs> Thank you. Woo! Whoever this is sponsored on your agenda tonight, make sure that you give them a well-deserved uh, hand tonight as we leave, or let's just do it right now. <laughs> Every question, every answer, and the number, so it'll be easy. 
So you press the button after being prompted. I'll tell you when we're ready. So uh, you can't start voting right away. We'll all vote at the same time. You have 10 seconds uh, to make your selection. Now, if you make a, a, step, a selection in that 10 seconds that you don't like, you can change it. You have 10 seconds to change it. So if the machine records your last response. So you can, you can be as ambivalent as you want for 10 whole seconds. Right. Uh, so there, and there's one question tonight that we, we have 10, answer, 10 potential answers to. And there's no 10 on your pack. But there's a zero. So in the case, if you want to select option number 10, you hit the, you hit the zero. Uh, don't, don't forget that you cannot take these keypads home and work your TV set with them. They, don't work, they only work in this kind of context. Uh, and so please don't, uh, please remember uh, to leave them on your table uh, and our, uh, we'll pick them up uh, before we have those. Okay, so let's, let's give it, let's give us a shot to see if we can, see if we can get a few basic things down to see, uh, see if we can work this right. Okay, when you're instructed, uh, press, the, press the number one on your keypad so we know who's here. So now you have 10 seconds, press the number one. Responses here. Some people aren't voting. 167. 167. Now uh, we've, we've 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 not encouraged the folks from Washington D.C. and Raleigh uh, to vote. Frank was right. This is what they might. Do. So, all right. So here are here's a sample question. All right. A chunky gal is one, the two-word description of a fourth grade classmate you wish you could take back now that she's your science teacher. Two, the worst ever label idea for women's plus side jeans. Three, a mountain in Western North Carolina. Four, a four-pound candy bar no longer available at Ingles. Say, okay, make your selection now. One, two, three, or four. Holy close. Look at that. 81% of the people. I'm a little worried. Uh, let's, don't even, let's not even think about it. Right. Okay, next. The word specs are one, the reading tools grandpa can never find, two, the local name for native brook trout. Three, the kinds of houses contract contractors have been building since 2008, or all of the above. Our apologies to the real estate brokers and contractors. <laughs> that one's for you, Brad. All right, ready? Start. One, two, three, or four. Okay, it's closed, and it? it's all of the above. All right. Uh, are the uh, the new slogan? This is this is a good kind of inside for those of you involved in TDAs in our region. And this is for you. Yeah. Uh, the new slogan for Jackson County tourism is one: help us keep the cash in cashers. Two. If you can't make it, just send a check. That's, that's sort of the model. Oh, that's a great economic development strategy right there. Not much success so far. Three, play on. Four, what the heck's a count? So ready, vote. One, two, three, or four. Okay. Wow. So Anne, are you gonna take this back to the cashiers? That's, that's a t-shirt possibility, you know. Uh, you can't make it since the check eight percent play on is is the correct answer for uh, the slogan for, for Jackson County and eight percent what's the exit count on the Chancellor Bosha wants to talk to you about that if you voted for that. All right. Uh, so now here's some demographic questions. We're going to get a little more serious. Probably, we got to know who's in the room in terms of age, 
uh, what counties you represent, that sort of thing. So, uh, so let's go through a series of questions here. So, uh, what is your age? No one, we're, we promise, this is not like the NSA that we're following <laughs> here. But we won't reveal this, it'll only be collectively. So, uh, is your age under 19, 20 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 or older? That's vote 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. Ready? Go. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, we're pretty well spread out. 1% under 19. Yeah, I mean, they deserve special credit. Right, right? All right. Everybody under 19, Rock, stand up. Thank you, thank you. But we have, we have a pretty good spread, a little better than the actual demographics of our region. Uh, so uh, so that, that's informative, and that helps us. And since each one of your, your voting devices are individually calculated, we can tell how people in those age groups respond to the questions we're going to be asking as we, as we move on. Okay, next. Okay, education level. Uh, one, less than a high school diploma. Two, high school diploma. Three, sub-college. Four, associate or bachelor's degree. Five, master's degree or PhD. One, two, three, four, or five. Go. <laughs> Lawyers get to say master's if you want. Lawyers. Okay. Ah, we have a very educated group in the uh, course of the group. Incredible. Uh, so 34% uh, actually with master's degree uh, or, or beyond. And, uh, and so definitely the majority of folks in the room uh, have a, a, at least a BA or beyond. So that's a, a very educated, educated group. Okay, next. Uh, how long have you lived in the region? This is an important question. A lot of polls. Uh, 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 differentiate the, 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 the responses from people in the region, differentiated uh, according to how long they've lived in the region. We want to see how that makes us up tonight. So, have you lived in the region, number one, zero to four years, two, five to nine years, three, ten to nineteen, four, twenty to twenty-nine, five, thirty to thirty-nine, wow, six, forty to forty-nine, seven, fifty-plus years. So one through seven, ready, boom. Okay. Wow, look how many people, 23%, 50 plus years. That's really, that's, that's spectacular. Uh, but a good spread throughout. Uh, we actually have more people uh, we only have, there's only 22% uh, of folks in the room who have lived here less than 10 years. So this is a this is a group that's uh, uh, that's been in the region, that's experienced the region for, for quite a while. Okay. Uh, now we you know we want to know where everybody lives. Uh, we have the, the eight choices here of the seven counties of Region A plus uh, the lands owned by the, by the Eastern Band. If you can, if you're a tribal member and you live someplace other than Koala Boundary. Pick the qual about right here, so we we'll, we'll want to make sure we're registered, we're registered in the presence of uh, tribal members. So one, Cherokee County, two, Clay County, three, Graham County, four, Haywood County, five, Jackson County, six, Macon County, seven, Swain County, eight, qual amount. Okay, before you vote, what do you think is going to be the biggest representation here tonight? Who wins the attendance vote? I think it's going to be Cherokee or Graham, but we'll listen, let's check. Okay, ready? Vote. <laughs> okay. All right. Woo! All right. Who would have thought? Uh, Tommy Jenkins gets a little credit for, uh, for turning out the troops from Macon County, but look at Cherokee uh, 
and Graham County, well, Graham County, twenty-three percent was the over, overall winner here. That's to be. It'll be a. I mean, let's give a hand for people, Graham County. <laughs> down from the highest altitude, they can barely breathe when they get down <laughs> this low. They have to cross lakes and rivers uh, and use multiple means of transportation. So anytime getting to and from Graham County, people deserve uh, credit for, for that. Uh, so that's great, that's a great turnout uh, for Graham County. So, all right. So now uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these keypad devices to have a little bit of a conversation. We have three of the, lead, of the leadership council members uh, from the opt-in effort that working with us throughout this entire process who will do a very short presentation of the of key elements of one of the three major components of our work. That is economic development, uh, natural and cultural resources, and infrastructures, particularly transportation policy. So uh, first up is uh, somebody everyone knows, Bill Drake, uh, a native of uh, the region, native of Macon, Macon County, and the poster child for entrepreneurism in North Carolina. Thank you. Uh, Speed gave me a timeline, and I was supposed to be finished 12 minutes ago. Uh, so I'm going to try to get us. I'm going to try to get us back on schedule here. Um, the chancellor stole everything I was going to say, so I don't need to talk much anyway. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to talk about uh, some of the economic issues. When, when I grew up in Macon County, Macon County was primarily a, a farming community. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of dairy farms in the area, uh, primary farm, uh, and the main corridor up through this whole region was 441. And everybody wanted to move here and then close the door so that nobody else would come in. Uh, <laughs> That, that was the general sentiment of, of most of Western North Carolina. We, we sort of didn't want anybody else. That, that has changed a lot. But we are a well-kept secret in Western North Carolina. I want to give you uh, three anecdotes. 46 years ago, I went to Governor's School West. Um, I was doing pretty good in school. I had to go to Governor's School. They had Governor's School East, Governor's School West. Guess where Governor School West was? <laughs> Winston Salem. <Yeah. laughs> that was that was sort of the, from the governor's office. That's sort of where the West was. Uh, when I when I talk to my customers today, I, I have customers from all over the country. When when I tell them I'm from uh, Franklin, North Carolina, they say, "Oh, is that close to Raleigh?" I say, "No, no, we're in the far southwest corner, far southwest corner." And they say, "Oh, so you're close to Charlotte?" Uh, uh, people know where the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is, so that's how I explain where we are. But that's outside this region, that may be about the only thing that we're known for. And we have to do better at marketing this region for tourism, um, for technology, um, and for infrastructure outside this region. And the only way we can get better at that is to do something that the Chancellor suggested, and that is team up with each other. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of how we have done, tried to do that recently. We just had a presentation this week from a CIS class at Western. The CIS class did a project for us. Um, they did it for free. Um, as part of their educational program, we are going to use some of the things that they developed and I hope we get to hire, in fact, we're trying to hire some of those folks that did the presentation right now um, to, to keep them from going somewhere else um, and, and getting a job. So that was a, a great partnership. I, I want to tell you about the way that we have partnered with the Eastern Band to build fiber in these seven western counties. We have over 225 miles of buried fiber. It's, I think it's an unusual thing for a private enterprise and a, a sort of a public entity to partner in those kinds of things. So I'm very proud of a couple of things that we've done. But my vision is in this region, for example, tourism. I, I am committed to, in my tourism venues, I'm committed to promoting the Eastern Band. I'm committed to promoting the Nantahala Outdoor Center. 
I am committed to promoting the Great Smoky Mountain Railroad. Um, all of those things. Now, of course, I want them to promote me too. Um, but that's the only, when folks come here from our state, we want them to spend not one night, but we want them to spend a week in, and enjoy the entire region. But as far as technology is concerned, um, the, the plan has really six things, and I think the Chancellor mentioned them all. But we've got to coordinate economic uh, development activities. We've got to diversify and expand the economy. We can't just be a farming community anymore. Um, we've got to be ready when that new industry shows up. We've got to have fiber, we've got to have water, and we've got to have sewer in more places than we've got it today. Um, we, have a, we have to facilitate the success of small businesses in Western North Carolina. It is not just the mega business. And granted, I, I love it when a big, it, it would have been great if we could have got Google to locate here. Um, but that, that ship sailed. What we can try to do, though, is try to encourage small businesses to locate here because of our quality of life. And we've got to train the workforce of the future. We employ about 50 Western Carolina University graduates. We employ a number of Southwestern Community College graduates. And they have done a great job at training for the things that we need. And finally, we ought to promote and support agriculture as a viable economic practice again in Western North Carolina. Um, and I don't mean just Christmas trees, even though that is a great business. If you're a Christmas tree farmer, more power to you. Um, that is a great business, but we've got to promote additional kind of um, farm-to-table kind of enterprises in Western North Carolina. That's all I got. <laughs> Okay, a good model for our uh, presenters tonight. So now we'll, take, we'll talk a little bit about uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, about uh, the economic development territory and ask you a few questions, just like we did with the questions earlier. So uh, first up, uh, how important is it to you uh, for our region to act as one, as a speaker with one voice, to act together? Is it very important? Two, somewhat important. Three, just important. Four, unimportant. Five, most unimportant. So vote for one, two, three, four, or five now. <laughs> this is not a trick question. <laughs> okay. okay. So most of the most of the folks you know, in the room, predictably, uh, almost seventy percent say it's very important. Seventeen percent. If you add those two together, uh, we have uh, over eighty uh, percent uh, that uh, say it's, it's very important or somewhat important. And I think we, I mean, we would probably be in this room. Uh, we didn't think it was at least somewhat important. So next, uh, how satisfied are you with the level of cooperation among governments in the region? Uh, once again, you're not going to be identified to the elected official sitting next to you, uh, but. Uh, the answers are one, most satisfied, two, somewhat satisfied, three, satisfied, four, unsatisfied, five, most unsatisfied. One, two, three, four, or five, vote now. Okay. Interesting. Interesting that 48 percent of the folks uh, say they're unsatisfied with the, uh, with the level of cooperation among the governments. This fits with an awful lot of the kinds of discussions we've had in the region in the survey that we, we've undertaken. Next. Uh, would you support cooperative agreements among counties to share opportunities and resources? Questions get a little harder as we move into so. Uh, so would you support cooperation? One, yes. Two, no, three, maybe. Okay. Eighty-one percent yes. That's very that's very encouraging. Uh, once 
once again, we would be frightened if we would come back uh, a definite no with the group in this room. Uh, uh, next. Okay, now this is important for us to kind of uh, understand uh, a little bit about where the levels, where, where the levels of priorities are in terms of what, what folks value. Uh, what unites us most as a region? One, our roads. Two, our mountains. Three, our attitudes and values. Four, our towns. Five, our leadership. Six, our people. Seven, our heritage. Eight, our faith communities and churches. Nine, I don't feel we are a region yet. Give a little consideration to this. This is, this is a lot of choices here, one through nine. Uh, go ahead and vote. This, as predictably, this is pretty spread out. Uh, there are a lot of things. It's very hard to choose between things that are that are right. It doesn't mean that, that, that any one is discounted. But it's important for us to understand where the priorities are. Uh, and clearly, uh, landscape, the, the mountains themselves are, are, are uh, have very strong forms in, in the region. Predictably, next. What should we do first? That is, what's our highest priority? to diversify our, common, our economy. One, coordinate economic development. Two, brand and market the region. Three, better, get, better integrate tourism with economic development. Four, ensure the success of small businesses. Five, train the workforce of the future. Once again, five hard choices, but we're interested in knowing what, what you think is the most important of these. One through five, go ahead and play. shown up strong, and better integrating tourism with economic development has been a consistent theme as you heard tonight from Chancellor and others, uh, and certainly that's Steve Morris's uh, mantra at Western, uh, and I think we've heard this throughout our interviews as well. Next, uh, to support agriculture as a viable economic practice, what's, what's the most urgent part of this? Uh, one, is to permanently, uh, to permanently protect fertile agricultural land. Two, prevent agricultural activities wherever they're appropriate. Three, support and expand farmers' markets. Four, promote agritourism. Five, buy local. Once again, we realize that all these are important. We're interested in what, what do you think is a, is a priority? Vote one through five, vote now. Sharon Taylor, we will be glad to see the high voting for permanently protect the fertile agricultural land. I'm not for that. <laughs> you shouldn't have admitted that. But you'll be up next, you get to defend yourself. Uh, okay, next. What would you talk about uh, to convince a business to move here? What's the most important thing? You would, what's the first thing you would, you, would, you would pitch? Is it the cost of living? Is it the workforce? Three, quality of life. Four, infrastructure. Five, business climate. Six, regional cooperation. One through six, go ahead and vote. Uh, 10 answer uh, 
response. So if you're going to vote for number 10 on this list, punch zero on the, on the keypad. So one, inadequate leadership. Two, degraded landscapes. Three, sprawling development. Four, traffic congestion. Five, weak economy. Six, public education. Seven, poor infrastructure. Eight, energy costs. Nine, demand for health care. Two, too few young people. One through ten, with, with ten being the zero on your keypad, do it now. showed up in many of our polls, uh, and too few, too few young people also double digits there. So uh, uh, that's an interesting response. And we'll, by the way, we'll post all these responses on the website so you can go back and revisit this and get a sense of how you match up with, with some of the other folks in the region who are responding to our polls. Next. All right, we'll, uh, Dr. Michael Smith is, uh, is a faculty member of Western Carolina University. We've used him on the leadership uh, uh, council and tapped into his expertise, expertise continuously. Uh, and we owe a lot of, uh, a lot of gratitude for Mike, who also reached out to people at ARC and Scott to make sure that they uh, they the work. So thank you for that, Mike. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I want to uh, start this, uh, just to tell you that this is not a report, but this is a call to action. I stand here before you today to ask for your support and advocacy for a regional vision for transportation. In order to accomplish what we have envisioned for the future of the region, we must now grow the resources available to the region. Effectively, this means that we need to increase economic vitality to have the means to make good things happen for the people here, which requires that we have to go beyond just exchanging money from hand to hand within these seven counties. Quite simply, we must do things that bring capital and cash inflows from outside of the region. Such inflows, inflows happen when we sell goods and some types of services outside this region, or when we bring in customers from outside the region to consume goods and services here. Notice that infrastructure is critical to success in attracting this kind of trade. For our region, this means investments in road, rail, and air infrastructure to effectively and efficiently transport products and people, and in some cases, fiber networks to transport information. There is nothing new about the recognition that transportation is crucial to economic development. We need to remember that 50 years ago, Enhanced transportation was adopted as the strategy for economic development and resulted in undertaking the Appalachian Development Highway System, or ADHS. Evidence from numerous perspectives shows that this strategy has been effective, but implementation is incomplete, as people in this room well know, and work remains to be done. Further, we must adjust the strategy to address existing and future conditions. The current vision process provides a framework for focusing our efforts, and it is towards such focus that I now turn my attention. Western North Carolina must be an integral part of trading networks that surround us, as well as making sure that the region can fully participate in global trade patterns. These link linkages need to be pervasive to ensure that the people throughout the region can readily participate in the advantages and resilient enough to ensure against isolation based on failure of individual links, as we've seen many times with things like slides and the like. It was for these ends that corridors were originally designated, and it is for these ends that we should envision the need to design solutions. It is essential that here and as we go forward, we boldly proclaim the need and urgency to implement feasible approaches to enhancing transportation linkages to address the needs of the people in our region and ensure a bright future for this region. 
Today we envision the, ne uh, the necessity of finding a financially and socialist, uh, socially realistic way to sustainably link the region to surrounding communities to the south and to the west. All of us gathered here need to make it clear that we see the need to make immediate steps to plan, design, and execute timely and economically feasible completion of improved highway connectivity in line with the intent of the original core of the in keeping with the overall vision of the region. In order to ensure economic feasibility, we must consider what is possible with the capital that is currently available, as well as consideration of what capital might be available <coughs> from other sources. In addition to highway upgrades, we also envision planning of alternative transportation capacity within the region. In general, the availability of a broad range of transportation alternatives enhances resilience, and the Western North Carolina region regularly experiences disruptions that are the result of a lack of such resilience. <coughs> Let me be clear, a lack of transportation alternatives disadvantages rural regions most strongly uh, relative to more urban settings in terms of economic development. We must strongly advocate for a full range of transportation alternatives in order to ensure that we do not fall behind in the future as we have in the past. As I conclude my remarks, I ask you to become active, passionate advocates for feasible actions to enhance our transportation system. And I ask you to take your advocacy to neighbors, regional leaders, politicians, and policy makers. Your, your participation truly can make all the difference in our creating a great future for this wonderful region that we all love. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and now we, we, uh, we're going to get to a few questions about transportation policy, which, which is the naughtiest problem, as we know, in a region that's so difficult to connect, as uh, uh, the Vice Chief talked about earlier in his discussion. So here are the questions. Uh, as we seek to improve connectivity within and outside the region, as Dr. Smith uh, talks about, which is more important? What's the priority? One, building new roads. Two, improving existing ones. Three, creating regional tra uh, transit opportunities. Four, expanding freight and passenger rail. Five, expanding our airports. So one through five, vote now. existing ones, 19, for creating regional transit opportunities, which is a surprising number for an area which is so difficult to do transit, even though we provide transit in all the counties and in the, uh, in the Kuala Boundary. Uh, expanding freight and rail, big passion for that, especially in Cherokee County, and, and expanding our airports, which, uh, which, which may be possible to be part of the mix, but it's important to keep in mind that, that, that where these priorities are, because you may not be hearing uh, about these priorities in the conversations you have uh, with, with friends in your, in your towns and counties. Next. As we design roads for the future, which is more important? One, roads that are safe. Two, roads that are efficient. Three, roads that are fast. Four, roads that fit with the scenic quality of the region. One, two, three, or four, go down. Okay. Roads that are that are safe, 22. Roads that are efficient, 26. Uh, roads that are fast, 6%.